Big shout out goes to Bridget Martin in Liverpool, England, Alexandra Josephine in Tampa, Florida, Daniel Avery, Crystal City, Missouri, and Marie Iacono in Chicago, Illinois. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you'd like for us to give you a shout out, just follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Give us a like, leave a comment, and maybe we'll give you a shout out too. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. Sells. All right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. In the studio with us today, Ray Amico. Welcome to the show. Greetings and salutations to you, Bob. It's been a while since we've seen each other. You've relocated out to the West Coast, and then you've also been on the road touring. Uh, I was in Nashville for uh, for a couple of years, uh, working on some stuff, which is the last time I had seen you. And then uh, the wife and I moved back out here to California within the last year. Just can't can't get enough of the weather, man. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, so we've been out here, and yeah, I've, I've always been a a tour rat, you know, tour guy nonstop for the last 25 plus years. So uh, I've been almost constantly on the road or, or back and forth from being on the road. And let's talk about that because that's when I look at your bio and I start reading this and we'll post this in the show notes. You have been out with more people on the road than even I. And that says a lot. <laughs> uh, just a few of them. Tony Braxton, George Lopez, uh, The Cult, Devo, Fiona Apple, Jane's Addiction, Jimmy Cliff. Panic at the Disco, Dream Theater, one of my absolute all-time favorite acts. I, I want to talk about them a little bit. Trans-Siberian Orchestra, on and on and on. First of all, how did you get started in this game? Yeah, to be honest, I started out, I uh, grew up in uh, in Queens, New York. And in the 80s, I was, uh, I was a guitar player, actually the guitar player and, and session bass player on all the recordings for a, a really weird, bizarre core, hardcore band called The Six and Violence, which was uh, a really, really strange, odd thing that, that we did for years playing on the New York hardcore scene. It was uh, six of us, obviously, for The Six and Violence. And the uniqueness of it was uh, there were two drummers, one drummer. Dave Miranda, who just played uh, uh, standing up with a floor tom, two racks, and a snare, no kick drum. So he played everything with his hands. And a separate cymbal player who played everything with cymbals. So the two of them formed this really unique percussion section. And uh, myself on guitar, uh, bass player, and two lead singers, we played very prog uh, influenced hardcore weirdness on the on the New York hardcore scene. So we we'd be playing with, you know, total skinhead punk, you know, serious, serious guys, and then there'd be us total clowns on stage playing this weird noise. We had go-go nuns on stage whipping us with chains with a guy in a gorilla suit running around throwing golf balls and hamburgers at the crowd and we'd play Twister on stage and it was bizarre. We had a lot, a, a weird, strange following, and and actually Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull. We were all huge Tull fans, and we had gotten uh, Ian to actually play two songs on our f- on our first record. So I've got a duet with with me and Ian Anderson on our first record on a song about going to the bathroom. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the year that they coincidentally that Jethro Tull won the Grammy for Best Heavy Metal uh, Band, which was a big controversy at the time because uh, they beat Metall- they beat Metallica out, and Metallica was like, what? <laughs> what? 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 happened so yeah it was a it was an interesting time i ask this question a lot what were your musical influences growing up who did you listen to 
To be honest, I grew up, my favorite, favorite band in the world, the first thing I was ever introduced to was uh, the band Devo that my uh, cousin introduced me to me when I was eight years old. And I spent the my entire life, not only I'm the person I am today because of Devo and their influence on me, but I forced my way into being their tour manager, production manager, front of house engineer. My wife was their secretary. So uh, we we're like all in the family. So I grew up literally since uh, 10 years old, eight to 10 years old, listening to Devo, Jethro Tull, Slayer, Stevie Wonder, and uh, Wendy uh, Wendy Carlos. I had a very, very diverse, uh, unique, weird kind of uh, eclectic palette. You said something that I find intriguing because when I first started in the business touring many, many years ago, I got a phone call from a buddy of mine and he said, hey, you want to go out on the road? I need a stage manager and a guitar tech. And I'm like, great. And I hung up the phone. And of course, this is pre-internet days. And I'm going, what's a stage manager and what's a guitar tech? And you kind of <laughs> learn by baptism by fire. And it wasn't the best gig in the world for me, but it did lead to another gig and another gig. And before long, you know, I'm working. You say you you basically kind of just put your foot in the door, forced your way in on, on Devo. Did you have any experience going in and taking those roles? What I did was I was a I was a studio engineer in the in New York back starting literally in the eighties playing in the Six and Violence. I was always the one of the band producing and engineering. I produced several other bands on the scene at that time. So by the early nineties, I was a studio engineer in New York for a couple of a couple of large scale A and M records uh, label studios. So I worked a lot of projects like Celine Dion and Taylor Dane and Mariah Carey at the time, and a lot of the bands that were coming in to the studio that I was working on. I worked on a, on Cheap Tricks record during the 90s, uh, a lot of other independent bands that were signed to these labels. And what I found was being a studio engineer, there was pretty much a glass ceiling, especially in the early 90s, of how far you were going to necessarily go producing engineering. The home studio was starting to become such a big thing that a couple of bands that, that I had been working in the studio with said, hey, would you come on the road with us and mix our sound and tour manage us? And since I was always... The, the one in, the, in my bands organized and running things and, you know, new sound and was an engineer. I basically hit the road with an English band that I was working with in the studio. They were an English band called Fat. I toured with them. I was the only guy. I was the only crew guy. So I was the van driver, the guitar tech, drum tech, front of house engineer, merch salesman. You know, I, I was literally myself and everything. And that was baptism by fire as far as touring with a band that I wasn't in. And literally within... A year or two of touring with them in a van, they got the opening slot on uh, on a tour that Third Eye Blind was headlining. And actually, the it was Third Eye Blind and it was Smash Mouth. And uh, Smash Mouth at the time had were just about to release uh, Walking on the Sun, so they moved into the uh, into the you know precious uh, direct support slot, and we were the opening band. And I basically was literally the only crew guy in a van in a trailer you know, dragging my, my band on tour with all the, these two other bands in trucks and buses and everything like that. And basically the production manager for Third Eye Blind at the time was a, uh, was a, a legend uh, in this business, Bill Ramey. He literally, after that tour, said, listen, after watching you work, whatever I get, he's like, I want you working with me. And within a couple of months, he called me up and he said, I just got the production manager gig for the Beastie Boys, and I want you to be my coordinator and come out on the road with me. So I went, I went literally from van and trailer the only crew guy busting my balls, doing everything possible to then running the entire production office on uh, on the Beastie Boys Hello Nasty tour. So it was it was an exponential growth, like very, very quickly. And and he's uh, between Bill Ramey and, and actually Bobby Schneider, who was tour managing Third Eye Blind at the time, both who are, you know, actual total mentors to me uh, ever since. It's interesting you say that because the almost exact same thing happened to me in that I was working a, a series of dates with, as a promoter rep of all things, with Lisa Lisa and the Colt Jam and Expose, and this is probably about 87, Bobby Dallas was the production manager, and he was like yep. the big guy back then. He had Aerosmith, and he was doing all the great tours. And I walked in the production office that morning, and Bobby and I had known each other for a few years, and he looks at me and he goes, what are you doing for the next couple of weeks? And I said, what do you need? And he goes, I've got to go fly home. It's an emergency. Here's the production binder. You're taking over the tour. And you're right. And you kind of go from 
driving yourself to a gig to the that night you're in a tour bus hitting the road and that's just what happens and you have to be ready you have to be prepared you have to have confidence in that uh i can do this job i've i've seen it done and i you know having the skills or the the abilities or at least the knowledge to be able to do them and then back in that day too i mean we're talking the 90s or so this was just a threshold of of laptop computers on the road and and internet and cell phones and everything so it was there's a lot of baptism by, baptism by fire you're thrown in the deep end of the pool and and swim and i mean and every gig that i've literally gotten from then has been pretty much you know just a word of mouth like hey what are you doing like i i've never i've never really worked for anybody i've never worked necessarily for for a management company or for a, a specific company i'm i'm an independent who what do you do how do you do it what's your resume look like oh that's who you've been with okay then you could do this and uh, whether it's mixing front of house or production managing or tour managing or tour accounting, it's just it's all different uh, arms of the octopus. You know, it's a. Uh... Yeah, I, I love the one thing you described it as uh, last week or so when we talked. You're the guy that follows the elephant in the parade, I think is how you put it. That is completely me. I am I am the guy with the shovel following the elephant and wherever he goes and whatever he leaves behind, I'm cleaning up or, or dealing with. And uh, yeah, that's 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 literally how I think of myself in, in this business, because, you know, there there's the good times, and the bad times. It usually is just something being thrown at you that you're that you have to deal with. And you got to be prepared. Yeah, there's got to be prepared to to do it and be very flexible and be very uh, modest and be very uh, be very modest and at the same time confident. You know, Barry Bonds was always considered to be very arrogant. All he had to do was turn around and say, "Yeah, but I can do it." Like you know, like so was was he arrogant for for the fact that he could hit you know 350 and and hit uh you know 70 home runs or was it just kind of like, "Hey, it's not arrogance. I can do it." But modesty is a very important uh, trait. You know, being you know, wh- who you see on the way up is who you're going to see on the way down. So be be very very be very honest about yourself and honest with everybody else. We're going to take a break, get a word in for our sponsor, and when we come back. We're going to have some more conversation with Ray Amico, who continuing to go down that list, who's worked with Weird Al Yankovic, uh, Nancy Sinatra, Eric Johnson, Sheik with Nile Rogers, Beastie Boys, as he said, Daryl Hall and John Oates. The guy's worked with everybody. We're going to have some more conversation with him here on the business side of music. Hey, this is Jack Forman with Bicoastal Productions. Join us as we have a look behind the mics and lights here on the business side of music. You're listening to the business side of music. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer Songwriter Rule Book 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer, songwriter, performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer, songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. Thanks. Hi, this is Tom Sabella, the creator, founder, and co-producer of the Business Side of Music podcast. It's loyal listeners such as yourself that make our podcast successful. Take the time to sign up for our weekly newsletter. Not only does it contain information on upcoming podcast episodes, but also informative tidbits on the music industry and even bonus items that we give away. All you have to do is sign up at businesssideofmusic.com and we will send you Larry Butler's new singer-songwriter rulebook. That's it. All you have to do is go to businesssideofmusic.com, sign up, and we will send you Larry Butler's new book. Thanks to all our loyal listeners. We love you. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. Back in the studio with Ray Amico here on the business side of music. Let's talk a little bit about Devo. That kind of seems to be where things really 
took off for you? The uh, the D- the Devo thing is a, a obviously a very deep thing for me because, like I said, it influenced my entire life. My you know still to this day. I mean, the last tour that we did just after Bob Two passed away was their hardcore Devo tour a couple of years ago, and and uh, they wanted me to tour manage like I normally did or production manage, and I said no no no. I said I I want to mix front of house for this, and Jerry from Devo was like really? He's like you don't want to tour manage it? I was like no no. I want to mix this tour. So uh, so I got to, I got to mix their basically what has turned out to be their last full tour that we've been able to do. Uh, hopefully, hopefully they will be able to do more. But, you know, as as time passes on, we'll see. But that, you know, Devo is basically a huge influence to me. And then going back and forth from different music groups like you were talking about, different uh, styles. So d- between Dream Theater and System of a Down, crazy heavy stuff to Nancy Sinatra and Fiona Apple and the diversity of like you're not just working you don't pigeonhole yourself into just one type of music that you're working with you know i'm with tony braxton one week i'm with smash mouth the next week i'm with uh you know i was with john fogarty last summer as production manager you have to totally just diversify yourself we were talking about you know all these acts that you've toured with you also had your own thing going on for a while on top of everything else you've done tour manager, production manager, front of house guy, tour accountant, the man of of many, many hats. As I like to consider myself in that era of my life, you're a renaissance man. You know enough of everything just to be dangerous, but to be able to pull it off. You also moved to Rome in Italy. Yes. And you lived there for a while. And you cut an album, Tyrannosaurus Ray. Yes, Tyran S. Soros Ray is. <laughs> yeah, basically, uh, I mean, being a musician myself, I had recorded, you know, demos and stuff like that all over where I lived in different places, etc. While I was production managing Dream Theater back in back in the in the early two thousands, um, we were touring Europe so much that uh, I had an Italian girlfriend that was my production assistant. I was just like, man, I'll just I'm just going to move to Rome. So I, I moved to Rome and was still production managing dream through at the time i basically compiled all the different things that i recorded all over the place recorded some more stuff while i was there and then put out a solo record you know of of all these different songs and uh actually had put that out and put out a double box set of this of the six and violence at, at the same year and i remember when it actually came out i was uh i was actually tour managing uh david archuleta for american idol and uh he even asked me he's like he's like did you put out a record i said no no i put out two records this year. I said, how many did you put out? So, uh, <laughs> so being a performer or being a musician, you know, I, it still feeds my soul to, to make music. I, I just literally in the past two days have just demoed a couple of songs here uh, while quarantined at home just to play and, and make some music with my friends. And we're going to play some of the cuts off of that album. Uh, one of them, my favorites uh, was I was listening to them. Hard ass. You actually wrote <laughs> that about someone. I actually wrote that as a tribute to Bill Ramey, the, my production manager mentor. Not that he is a hard ass per se, just in terms of being able to take care of whatever you have to take care of when you have to take care of it. So yeah, I, I wrote the song Hard Ass as a tribute to both Bill Ramey and uh, the, the lead singer of my band, The Six and Violence, who passed away, uh, Pauly, Pauly G, Paul Gazzara, who was a total hard ass. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that song is a tribute to both of those guys. Different shows, different productions. Obviously, Nancy Sinatra is going to be a lot different than Jim Gaffigan. Dream Theater, like I said, one of my favorite acts. What type of work goes in to put that show on? Coincidentally enough, the way that I came into it was they were tour- they were touring with Queensryche at the time. And so what they wanted to do was kind of combine roles so that the production manager would take care of both bands. So at the time that I came into it, I was production managing both Dream Theater and Queensryche on a tour, which was interesting because obviously both legendary bands of uh, intricate, you know, very involved. Their, uh, their encore involved literally both bands playing on stage at the same time. So you're talking about a 110 inputs to front of house, you know, four dr- four kick drums, you know, like going at the same time. I mean, it was just craziness. And then when the tour ended, both bands asked me to continue on. I kind of had a choice to make and just the Long Island, New York connection and how much I always really liked uh, Dream Theater and, and I'm such a big prog rock fan. So I, I was with, uh, with Dream Theater for several years all through the uh, uh, Train of Thought tour and the Octavarium tour, et cetera, for, for, for several years. It was great. I mean, the, the production level 
is only matched by the musician level. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's a very very uh, specific, very uh, production heavy, very artistic uh, kind of production. So it's it's certainly not simplistic in any kind of way. So it really pushes you. You said 110 inputs. Is that just you at the board making it all happen? Did you have someone helping you? Yeah, no, no. Fortunately, I wasn't mixing. I wasn't mixing those tours. Our front of house engineer at the time, his name is Nigel Paul, is fantastic engineer. We took out basically we took out the Yamaha PM One D on one of the first tours that Yamaha had put that out with uh, all of these uh, sidecar edition kind of inputs. So you I mean to 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 have that many inputs running to front of house really really pushed their uh, their capabilities to to the full limits, and uh, it was crazy for you know for that that many inputs to front house all running at the same time uh was amazing but uh no i was not mixing i had my hands full production managing on that some some gigs you can you can double up and you know i'll be front i'll be production manager and front of house a gig like that i wouldn't even attempt to do it both do you have a favorite act of all these artists that you ever went on is there one that stands out more i'm not going to ask you if there's one you would never tour with again because <laughs> we all have those do you have one that just like man this has been this has been the the cat's meow touring with devo and everything that i did with devo forever is so important to me because they were the most important thing in my life from from growing up first thing i ever ever listened to biggest influence in who who i am the reason i am what i am and then obviously the connection of me meeting my wife through them and you know literally being in the family with them and then fiona fiona apple is i mean i've been with her over 15 years she's like a little sister to me uh, you know I, I love her to death and you know so i mean just just getting to getting to help any artist do what they do is you know is a thrill especially when you really love what they do particularly with fiona i love her i love what she does and so to be able to be her guy and and the trust that she puts in me of like i trust you to take care of this and 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 do this with me has always made me happy but with a lot a lot of artists it, it's made me very very happy that i've been lucky enough to really get to tour with a lot of artists that i really really am passionate about and care about their uh what they do you mentioned it we're all quarantined at home right now because of what's going on in the world you actually kind of had a you actually had a double whammy you were out with an italian artist and you were down in south america we had a tornado come through Nashville. You were, I guess, still living here, transitioning at that time. You lost the storage unit that a lot of your stuff was in. And then within 10 days, two weeks, now you had a coronavirus. You had to shut a tour down and, and get people home. I was touring with uh, Eros, which is an all-Italian band and, and crew, et cetera, like that. So we were in January and February this past a couple of months ago. We were on tour in Central and South America, and we had just started hearing rumblings about what was going on. And obviously, Italy was one of the first places it hit. So all of our Italian band and crew members were you know, very getting very concerned about what was happening with their families. And how, you know, they were already starting to talk about quarantining and locking, locking parts of the country down. So as that was developing, just qu literally coincidentally, that's when the tornado in, in Nashville had hit. And my wife and I, we had made our move back to California, but I, I had put a lot of my music and uh, studio gear and memorabilia and everything in a storage unit in Nashville temporarily until I could sort it out uh, with the idea of going back there and taking the things that I wanted to bring back here to California with me. But unfortunately, it took a direct hit in the tornado. I left the tour. I literally flew straight to Nashville and was able to go in and salvage a couple of things here and there. A lot of things were just you know, water damaged. Uh, the walls had collapsed in, so some was too dangerous to remove. And then I literally, whatever I could salvage, I had to throw into a different storage place and rush back here before the shelter in place order came in. So I've literally been here. I have my guitars and stuff here, but I didn't have a single guitar cable. I didn't. I didn't have an interface. I didn't have anything. So fortunately, a lot of my a lot of my good friends have taken pit, taken pity on me, and they've been sending me, "Hey, I'm not using this," or "Hey, take this." And so I've been collecting a couple of things. So literally, just this past week, I've I've started to just demo a couple of things just for my own head of playing some tunes that I'm sending to friends of mine and having here you lay this down and you put something down on this and and try to make something positive out of it while you're quarantined at home are you what's the forecast are you looking at dates coming up down the road are you looking at tours what what is it that you're hearing um a lot of us tour managers and production managers I mean the whole 
the whole, uh, let's say, touring family, the extended touring family. Um, we've been doing a lot of uh, talking to each other, webinars. I, just, I was just on one this morning with a couple of other tour managers and production managers. I mean, everyone's trying to remain positive yet uh, pragmatic. It's a very difficult time. I'm watching everything that's going on. And I think just from a standpoint of from the promoters and from the booking agents and from the artists themselves and the audiences and the venues, this is going to be a, a very, very, very slow transition back into it. So, you know, I think it's going to be baby, baby steps over a long period of time to see. I've been very fascinated with um, what people are doing as far as live streaming and trying to, to do those things. And uh, you and I were actually talking a little about that. I'm, I'm just keeping myself on the, on the edge of, uh, of research, talking to people so that as a production manager, the various clients that I have, if they come to me, you know, the little, the bat signal goes off in the sky and it's like, hey, Ray, what do you think we can pull off? I want to have the ammunition in my, in my back pocket of saying, well, listen, we can do this. We can do this. We can, we can pull this off. We can, you know, go to this extent. It's just uh, really pragmatically looking at the situation and seeing what could be done. But personally, I, this is going to be a, this is going to be a while. This is going to be a, this should be hopefully a, not only a slow ramping back up, but I really, really hope this has been a learning point, a pivot point where people learn from this and say, okay, we can't go back to how we were doing things. We need to, we need to do the new thing. We need to, we need to learn from this experience. I hope. And everybody's going to have to at some point get on the same same page at the same time we can't do this by city by city or county by county everybody's going to have to start because you're not going to be able to put a tour together if you can go to north carolina but you can't go to texas uh the definition of a tour is that it's going it's touring it's it's moving like the old line uh from a league of their own the train moves on the station stays here so you know like we've got to tour this we've got to go from place to place to place that's got to be able to be done just going to one place and doing a show is a unique thing very cool but to tour, to bring this to the masses, to the people, and go from place to place, it involves a lot of logistics that nowadays are going to have to be really looked at of how, how you can re how can you reasonably do it, and it be cost effective. Cost effective, uh, definitely. Be able to monetize how things can be done, keeping in mind that people's personal economies and, and the overall economy. I mean, people are not going to have expendable income for things for a long time. You know, if your favorite artist was coming to town, if the, it's a choice between feeding your family and going to see your favorite artist, I have a feeling you're going to have to feed your family first. So that expendable income is going to be a, is going to be a thing for a long time as well. We're going to take another break. We come back. I want to talk a little bit about the organization you actually texted me a, a while back called tourmanagement.org. I want to dig into that a little bit more. As we go out, we're going to play the song Hard Ass. In the studio with us today, Ray Amico. Incredible amount of carnage right before our eyes. <laughs>
Wow, I just joined the Music Starts Here community. This is a truly hidden gem for anyone in the music business. Whether you live in Nashville or anywhere else in the world, Music Starts Here is like a GPS for your music career. This is the place to be if you want to get advice and direction from some seriously talented musical people who have been where you want to go. Music news, events, and a great big community with resources for artists, songwriters, musicians, studio and tech, along with music business advice from pros in the industry, all on one site. Make sure you get your free profile now. Go to www.musicstartshere.org. That's musicstartshere.org. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio, Ray Amico is with us today. Tour management, production management, tour accounting, they're all different hats, but they all pretty much reside in the same office uh, when you're on the road. A young, aspiring person, and I hear this a lot, people, I want to be a road manager, I want to be a tour manager, I want to be a production manager, and they want to get into this, this circus that you and I have been in for many, many years tourmanagement.org tell us a little bit about that is that something that would work for someone who's aspiring or is that more for established people in the business or a little of both it's actually it's actually both uh, a friend of mine henry bordeaux uh, another fellow tour manager and several other tour managers and production managers of note have organized it and they're doing uh weekly webinars uh they just did one today in fact and it's really is a a, a proper mentoring kind of uh place to go tour management uh mgmt t-o-t-o-u-r-m-g-m-t dot org they've been posting webinars doing it live and also on youtube etc each different episode is concentrated on different aspects of touring like settlement advancing shows international touring it, so it's a treasure trove of information. So I, I'm involved on the peripheral of, uh, of helping them out whenever I can and being being involved uh, as much as I can. But I completely encourage anyone that's interested at all in touring to uh, definitely go look into it and organ- and uh, and sign up for it. Uh, go onto the webinars. Be involved in it. You can ask questions and answers live. All of us are open for mentoring, and I mentor. I mentor several different uh, tour and production managers, and and when they've been getting their start, and still to this day, they're friends of mine. We we stay in touch. Anything that I can help them do, it's for us guys that have been around now for years and years doing this. You can't do this forever. I mean, it's 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 a really it's a really fast spinning merry-go-round, and it's really hard to jump off while it's while it's spinning that hard. But at some point, either have to get off the merry-go-round or you're going to get thrown off the merry-go-round physically or, or whatever so the younger people that are doing this now i'm i'm very encouraging of, of trying to help them get whatever heads up they can and the other thing too is when you're young and you're single and you're hungry it's a great gig to get into but once you're married and you have kids and you know they're playing baseball or football or hockey or soccer or whatever it is and your wife wants to go out on date nights when you're thousands of miles away sometimes across the pond or across the globe it is a tough job and you really you have to want this really badly in order to do it yeah you're totally right it's it's definitely for when you can do it that way without all those other responsibilities. The other thing too is, and, and I, I don't say this as just a grizzled grizzled old tour guy, it's not as glamorous as it used to be. It used to be a lot more fun. It's a lot more of a, of a, of a straight ahead business nowadays. Uh, traveling, even before all this happened, traveling is uh, is uh, a grief. It's it's no longer glamorous like it used to be. It's it's a it's a it's a hardcore grief to fly everywhere and travel and everything. You know the circumstances of, of touring and everything like that may have changed in a lot of ways to get better. It's just uh, it was it was a lot of fun back in the day. Di- back in the days, not that it's not that it's not fun anymore, but it's definitely become way more of a of a of a corporate business kind of thing. It really has changed because you know when I started in it back in the eighties, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have laptops. You carried a roll of quarters and a notepad, and you found your payphone or you wait till you got to your hotel and picked up your messages, and that's how you did business. Now it's more twenty four seven, and you know there really is no downtime, especially when you're in one of those roles. The tour management organization, the mentoring, is is there a cost to sign up? Is there a cost to be involved in the webinars? How does that work? From everything that I've seen, everything, it's more of a just join and participate kind of thing. Uh, I don't know if Henry's uh, 
got things organized even deeper than that. There, there, there might be some things that he's got uh, up his sleeve coming up to really expand it and organize it. As of right now, in terms of something that I can recommend someone who's interested and wants to learn more about it, I would completely recommend going to that site to uh, tourmanagement.org and to spell it again, just to make sure, T-O-U-R-M-G-M-T dot org. Look at it on LinkedIn, look at it on uh, Facebook, look at it on uh, on the website. It's a really good thing that I, I can highly recommend. Ray, thanks for being on the show. This has been great. Bob, this is awesome. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. And it's been a lot of fun catching up with you. It's been a, been a, a long, long time. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Los Angeles, California and Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Busan. still here? It's over. Go home. Go.